Today's lecture is going to be on World War I that will happen from 1914 to 1918. At the beginning of this uh, presentation, we'll look at the costs of this war. World War I is going to be the world's largest war up to that point in world history in terms of casualties, nations involved, cost of the war. Um, and this is a calamitous event that is going to destroy much of the empire of Europe. So what could have caused Europeans to massacre themselves in such large numbers? So letter A is causes of the war. We're going to start with a political slash economic cause of the war, imperialism. If, we had, if you remember, we had talked about uh, in last, the last unit, period five, that Europeans, because of the industrialization, industrialization, needed to go get raw materials all around the world. And so they needed to get colonies. And so we see in this picture, England is reaching across Europe and going and grabbing big chunks of Africa for gold or diamonds or India for cotton. And so the European nations have industrialized and they're going out and getting colonies around the world for their raw materials for industry back in Europe. But as these Europeans compete and scramble to go around the world and to get those colonies, that's going to cause frictions between European powers which will eventually lead to World War I. Europe is in this kind of compete-or-die mentality at this point in the, in the quest for empire, and it's just going to create animosities, like I said, which is going to be one of the causes of World War I. Next, we have more of a cultural idea of nationalism. Nationalism, again, started in the last period, period five, and it's the idea that my ethnic group, my quote-unquote nation, is the best, it's dominant, and we should run the world because we are the best. And so if the English feel this way, and the Germans feel this way, and the French and the Spanish feel this way, of course this is going to create competition, which will eventually lead to conflict among the European powers. Next cause we have is militarism. Militarism is when a country decides to spend much of, it, much of its resources, not on social programs, but on the military. The Europe is decided, European countries are deciding to do this at this point because as they go around, as we saw on the last slide, as they go around and try to grab colonies around the world, they need militaries to do that. Not only to capture the, these colonies, but to hold on to them. And also, if we look back at the last slide, nationalism, if, if we look at the bottom right-hand picture, if Germany feels that they're the best ethnic group out there, they're the most proud of their nation-state, then they need to have the biggest military as well. And so we see that European countries are not just going out and getting colonies at the end of period five, beginning of period six, but they're also building up their militaries to protect those colonies, to go get those colonies, and also build up national pride. We have the best military in the world. Now at this point, at the very beginning of period six, we see as an example, this arms race that develops between England and Germany. Germany is a fairly new country. They just became a country in the later part of period five, and they're making up for lost ground, and these Germans feel that they're the best, that their nation demands it, they need to get have colonies, and so in order to get those colonies, they're building up their military. Um, so we see the Germans build battleships, and so the, the English, who also believe in empire and nationalism, think, well, we can't let the Germans defeat us, and so they build up their, their military. And we have this arms race, whether it's for tanks, or not tanks yet, but whether it's for battleships or dreadnoughts or um, artillery pieces, we see if the other country has 10 of them, we need 20, and if we have 20, they need 30, and so forth and so on. And so now Europe is armed to the teeth. This, of course, makes a climate that would be very easy for war to erupt. I'm trying to paint a picture here or contextualize Europe at this point, is we have a Europe that is competing with each other for empire. They all think, they all believe in nationalism and that their country is the best and there's no second place for them and they're armed to the teeth. And so we've got this kind of simmering cauldron of Europe where they're ready, anything could send them in to a war that would devastate the entire continent. And so we see here an example of a picture from Germany at this time, and it's really emphasizing the concept of nationalism. I'm sorry, of militarism. If you want to be a man in Germany or in England or in France at this time, you have to be in the military. It's the manly thing to do. And our country is amazing and strong, and there's nobody like us. And so if all countries believe in this militaristic, kind of machoistic um, approach to foreign policy, it's going to lead to war. Now we're getting to some of the more proximate causes, some of the causes that are going to lead directly to the war. 
we have this thing called the alliance system. So with this, as I describe this con context of Europe at this time, of all of these countries you see on the map armed to the teeth, they all think they're the best, they're all jockeying for empire around the world, they understand that war is probably in the near future. And if I'm England or Great Britain on this map, I know that Germany is my number one rival. We've each been building up our military. I want somebody to help me out in the coming war. And so Germany makes a treaty of alliance with France. Um, now, Germany knows that, that their enemy is Great Britain, and they know that England is going out there and getting allies, and so Germany makes an ally of Austria-Hungary, and then, you know, France will make an ally of Russia, and the treaties between countries just keep building and building and building, because they're all gearing up for this, for this fight in the future. And this alliance system, as we will find out soon, is going to widen the war quickly. Because if one nation goes to a war, then all the other nations that are allied with them have to go to the war. And so the war will go from just a war between two countries to a war of all of Europe. So now let's shift gears a little bit and let's look at the sick man of Europe, or the Ottoman Empire. Now if you remember we've talked about in the previous period, period 5, the Ottoman Empire is having a lot of internal and external problems and it's shrinking. It's slowly collapsing. Um, for various reasons that we've already talked about. And so as the Ottoman Empire collapses, everything that's got color on this map, um, we will see that other countries want to take advantage of this collapse for their own ends. And so in the Balkan Peninsula, which is here between the Black Sea and the Adriatic, um, and just north of the Aegean Sea, that all used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, but as they're crumbling and falling apart, some of those pieces suddenly come up um, and they're, they're ripe for the taking. And so the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, um, they want to take advantage of the decrease of the Ottoman Empire and go in and snatch up some of that land that's being left behind by the shrinking Ottoman Empire. And one of the pieces of land that they get is a place called Serbia. Now, if you look at the left-hand arrow, the red arrow that's going down from Austria-Hungary, that's approximately where Serbia is. And the Austrian-Hungarians want Serbia. They want to control it. Um, they want to add it to their empire. The Ottomans can't keep them out because they're shrinking. And so the Austrian-Hungarians are increasingly going to exert more and more power over Serbia. Now, the problem is that the people of Serbia, many of them are Slavic. That's their ethnic group. And they don't want to be controlled by Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary is a different ethnic group. They are Slavic. They want to have the Slavs control their own destiny. Once again, we see how nationalism is going to be a part of this story of the beginnings of World War I. Now, another Slavic people out there are the Russians. The Russians are Slavic, and they feel sympathy... Um, towards the Slavic people in Serbia who are now suffering under, as they would say, suffering under the control of the Austrian-Hungarians. And so the Russians want to give weapons and money and help to those Slavic Serbians so that eventually someday they can throw off the foreign power of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and gain their independence. And so the, the Russians are going to fund a terrorist cell. We can see four members of the terrorist cell. These are Slavic, ethnic Slavic Serbians who live in Serbia. And so if we look and they're in the orange part of the map that the arrow is going to, the, the Black Hand is the name of this terrorist organization. And like I said, they are ethnically Slavic and they want to get the Austrian-Hungarians out of Serbia. And the Russians are giving them encouragement and aid to do that. Now, this all will build up the story of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The Archduke is a high-ranking member of the royal family of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, as we see on this map here. Now, just underneath Austria-Hungary is the small area of Serbia. Um, and we told it, talked about on the last slide how the Austrian-Hungarians are increasingly getting into Serbia and taking it over. Well, the Archduke decides that he is going to go visit Serbia. It's a new area that the Austrian-Hungarians are controlling. He wants to go there to see what's going on, um, to you know, demonstrate to everybody that the Austrian-Hungarians now control this area. And so he and his wife, they go to Serbia to, as a, like I said, a show of Austrian-Hungarian power. Now, waiting in Serbia is this terrorist organization that we talked about, the Black Hand, the Serbian nationalists who wants Serbia to be controlled by Slavic people, not the Austrian-Hungarians. And so as the Archduke tours, the, tours Sarajevo, a city in Serbia, um, the Black Hand will shoot and assassinate the Archduke, also killing his wife and her unborn child. Now, of course, this is, a, a, this is an act of terrorism. It's trying to create terror and 
to to help the Serbians get their independence. And the Austro-Hungarians are very upset about this. They think that Serbia was to blame for this, not just the terrorist organization, but in fact the government in Serbia. And so the Austro-Hungarians declare war against Serbia for allowing the Black Hand to, you know, to shoot one of their um, royal family members. Now the Serbians have a secret treaty with the Russians. Remember we talked about this alliance system. So what should have been just a small war between the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and Serbia now is going to widen because the Serbians are going to call their Russian friends into the war. So now Austria-Hungary is not just fighting the Serbians, but they're also fighting the empire of Russia. And of course, the... the um, the Austrians know that this is this is certainly a bad situation for them. The Serbians they could have handled. The Serbians and the Russians is too much for them. And so the Austrian-Hungarians call in their secret treaty with Germany. So now Germany's in the war. And so you can see how the secret treaties, uh, these alliance system expand the war. Well now Russia, um, they all they have a secret uh, treaty with France. And Russia, they were fine just taking on the Austro-Hungarians, but now that the Germans are also involved in the war, Russia's like, oh my gosh, we need help on this. And so now the French get dragged into this war. And eventually, eventually the British will get dragged in as well because they have a treaty with France. And so we see this small assassination attempt, um, that the, the, the small assassination that goes on in Serbia, not only drags Austria-Hungary and Serbia into the war, but it drags on all of these surrounding European powers because of the alliance system. And so now we're involved into World War I. So let's talk about um, the start of the war. So letter B, Central Powers, or what's known as the Triple Alliance. The Central Powers are in red on this map. They are Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. And eventually the Ottoman Empire will join this as well. Um, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and so we see that the Germans, they're the real main player here. Even though Germany did not start this war, um, they did get dragged into this war because of their secret treaty. But Germany is the main player in the Central Powers. They have the largest economy, the biggest military, the most people. And so they're going to be the main uh, mover and shaker among the Triple Alliance, or what is known as the Central Powers. And Germany knows that they've just committed... A mistake that they're going to be fighting what is known as a two-front war. They're going to be fighting Russia on the eastern front and France on the western front, and the Germans know that this is not a good situation. You're going to have to split your army, which is going to weaken you, and it's not a good way to fight a war. And so the Germans come up with something called the Schleifen Plan, and it's spelled up there on the on the PowerPoint. And this is their plan to win a two-front war. So what they decide to do is that Russia, even though it's a very large country, it's not all that industrialized, and they don't have a lot of railroads, and it's going to take them a while for them to raise a big enough army to take the Germans on. So the, thing, the Germans know on the eastern front, they have time. They don't have to immediately send troops to the eastern front right away. It's going to take Russia time to, to bulk up, as it were. And so what the Germans decide to do is they are going to attack with all of their forces. They're going to attack France first. They believe that if they can take all of their army and take it to the Western Front, they can knock France out of the war, end the war there, and then they can send their troops back across Germany and then deal with the Russians on the Eastern Front. So this is what's known as the Schlieffen Plan, is that they're, that's how they're going to take, a, take on this two-front war. Uh, a quick war against France knocked them out of the war, and then a longer war against the Russians. Now, of course, this all depends on if they can knock the French quickly out of the war. And so it's an all-out attack against the French. Now, to do this, the French, if you can see in this map, the French and the Germans share a boundary right there in the middle of Europe. And the Germans know that if their plan is going to be a success, they have to attack France quickly and knock them out of the war. The problem is the French have their army waiting at the boundary between France and Germany, and that would take too long to push through that boundary. So the Germans think, well, let's, let's do something unexpected. Let's invade France through neutral Belgium. Belgium is green on this map because they're neutral. They're not supposed to be involved. And so the Germans say to the Belgians, well, look, we're coming through your country, basically like it or not. And so they invade through Belgium. And that's a surprise attack because the French weren't expecting the Germans to come through Belgium. And so when the Germans hit the French boundary up near Belgium, they're almost unopposed. And they're able to drive towards Paris. Now, as the German army moves through Belgium, we get what is known as the Rape of Belgium. German troops 
went through Belgium and they rape, pillage, and plundered their way according to the Allies of France and England. And they did do quite a bit of horrible things to to, to Belgium. They went through Belgium and they, they burned what they could. There is uh, some mass rapes that go on by the German army. Um, there's lots of destruction of property. It was an unprovoked attack. And so the people of Belgium, of course, are angry about this. Um, and England, as we're going to find out later on, is going to use this attack of Belgium, what they call the Rape of Belgium, to try to create propaganda to get the Americans involved, to convince them of the untrustworthiness of the Germans and how the Americans have to eventually get involved and fight the German quote-unquote menace. Um, and so we'll talk about that later. But the Germans march through Belgium and they almost go unopposed to Paris. Now this is going to bring the, the Brits into the war because the British have a treaty with the Belgians. That's another one of those secret treaties or alliances. And so the Germans, um, when they move, like I said, when they move through Belgium, that does give them an advantage into France, but it also will bring the British involved in the war, so the war gets even bigger. Here we see some of the propaganda that the British are going to put out there to try to get make the Germans look bad. And so this is a great example of point of view. We see this British propaganda poster. It says, remember Belgium, buy bonds, liberty loans, those kinds of things. And this poster is trying to get people to support the war because they show a German soldier with the spike on his helmet grabbing a Belgian girl and he's, you know, he's going to rape her is what's implied in this picture and he's going to burn her home. And so this is, these posters are created by governments to try to get people to support the war, either to loan money to the government or to sign up for the, for the army or those kinds of things. And we'll see a lot of this going on during World War I. Now, other countries will join in as well. Um, so we'll see on here that, um, like I told you, the Ottoman Empire is going to join the Central Powers, and so is Bulgaria. Um, now, opposing what you see in pink, the Central Powers, is we're going to have something called the Triple Entente. The Triple Entente is basically what we'll call the Allies. It's the United Kingdom, France, and Russia. There are other countries that join in as well, but they are the major players. So Europe, as we can see, is very divided. Japan will join the Triple Entente as well in this war. Even though the Japanese have nothing really to do with what's going on in Europe, the Japanese believe that they should declare war against the Central Powers because it's an opportunity for them. The Germans have colonies and ports in China, and if the Japanese who want more ports in China, if they declare war on the Germans, maybe they could use this war as an excuse to steal some of those German ports in East Asia. And so that's why the Japanese get involved in the war, although they don't see, although they don't see any action actually in fighting in Europe. Italy will switch sides in the war. We don't need to go into that too much, but if you were wondering why they're a different color as opposed to on a, a previous map. Now, this is called a world war because colonies, of course, are going to be brought in. This war does not just occur in Europe. As we had talked about, uh, Europe at this time has colonies all over the world as part of their empire. And so when the United Kingdom and France go to war and when Germany goes to war, their colonies will go to war with them, either supplying troops or they'll use these, colony, these colonists around the world to attack other colonies to try to gain land around the world. And so this really is a world war. It's not just a European war. Here's the best example I can give you of that is Australia is a part of the British Empire at this point. Um, and the Australians, they will raise troops to support the British in, involvement in the war. As we're going to find out the British uh, will run out of men. And to uh, augment their military, they'll bring in a bunch of what we call Anzacs, or Australians. And the Australians will see a lot of action primarily against the Ottomans um, down in the Balkan Peninsula um, at a place called Gallipoli, um, which is in the Balkan Peninsula and also in the Anatolian Peninsula. So that's where they'll see most of their action. Um, and so we see that colonists will get brought in from all over the world. And like I said, the Anzacs is a great example of that. So let's talk about the Western Front. Now, World War I, we can divide into the Eastern Front and the Western Front. Uh, the Western Front is going to be Germany's border between England and France. Um, and so we had talked about the Germans moving through Belgium and surprising the French. And since it was the sneak attack through Belgium, the Germans are able to drive almost unopposed to Paris itself. They're just on the outskirts of Paris. In fact, the German army could hear some of the church bells of Paris um, ringing. That's how close they got. 
is this is not something you might see on the AP exam, but it's kind of a fun story, is that the French army is down at the bottom of this map. Remember, the French army was between, was right on the German-French border, and they were caught surprised by the Germans coming in, in the north through Belgium. And so the French desperately need to get their troops back to Paris, back to protect uh, their country's capital. And so we have this wonderful story of how Parisian or Paris taxicab drivers come to the rescue. They go to where the, the French troops are in the south, they get them in their taxi cabs and they rush them to Paris and to the front line, um, thus allowing the French to get to stop the German advance before they can take the capital of, of France and basically win the war. Um, and so we see that the French are able to, just in the nick of time, stop the German advance, along with, you see, British troops there as well and some Belgian troops. They're able to um, eventually stop the German advance, which is bad for Germany. If you remember, their plan was to knock France out of the war quickly and then transfer all their troops to the Eastern Front. And when the German advance stalls on the Western Front, of course, that's going to be bad for the Germans in the long run. So we'll just give you one of the main battles of this war. It's the Battle of the Marne. Um, this is where we see that the French are, and the British are going to stop the German advance. Um, and when that happens, that's a very important battle because it stops the German advance. And so now Germany has to send a good chunk of its troop. Um, they have to withdraw them from the Western Front and send them back to the Eastern Front to fight the Russians. So let's go to D, a costly war. World War I is going to average about 1,000 casualties per day for four years. Uh, that is dead and wounded. And it's in a staggering number to think about that happening every day. And so the question is, why was this war so bloody? Why was it so costly? Well, generals at the time had been using old tactics. In the past, when countries went to war in Europe, the weapons weren't all that accurate. And so the only way to really kill your enemy was to get right up next to your enemy and try to overwhelm them with numbers and sheer force. And so that's what the generals in World War I did, is they took these massive human wave attacks where they would throw their army at the enemy. And in the past, that would work, like I said, because the, the weapons weren't all that accurate. But this is, of course, after we've had the Industrial Revolution. And Industrial Revolution and the Scientific Revolution, we've gotten much better weapons that are much more accurate and can fire faster. And now we have machine guns. And so those are the new weapons that we see. We also see flamethrowers and some other things like that. And so the generals using these old tactics of throwing these human waves at the enemy versus these new weapons of the Industrial Revolution, machine guns and the like, is going to re result in massive casualties. Here's another example of new weapons. Artillery is going to get much more accurate and bigger. As you can see by the size of this picture, they're going to do horrible damage to these human waves. If we bunch up all of our soldiers and throw them at the enemy, when one of these artillery shells lands amongst them, it's just going to tear them up. Next, I had mentioned flamethrowers. Of course, obviously very successful against mass uh, human wave attacks. Horrible way to die, so we see the impact of this new technology on the war. And then we also get this thing called chemical warfare. The best example I can give you of that is mustard gas. Mustard gas is, it, it's it put in a shell and the the army you know, puts it in an artillery piece, they send it against the enemy, and the shell explodes, but it doesn't kill by exploding. What happens is it releases this gas called mustard gas because the gas looks a mustardy yellow color, and it kills by burning. And so if the, the gas gets on your skin, it can burn your skin. If it gets in your eyes, it'll burn your eyes. And so we see these long line of World War I veterans who have been blinded by a gas attack. And if it gets in your lungs, it'll burn your lungs and kill you in that way. And so we see that World War I soldiers had these gas masks on, um, but oftentimes they couldn't get to the masks in time, or the mask maybe had a hole in it. Um, and so we see uh, horrible casualties because of the impact of the Industrial Revolution and these new technologies creating devastation on the front. Another thing we see is barbed wire. Barbed wire was invented as a way to keep animals penned in, but we, we noticed that we could use this as an obstacle between the armies. And so when one army throws their, their army at the other army, um, we see that this will slow them down. And in order to get across it, you have to take a plank and get across it, or you have to crawl underneath it. And it takes a lot of time, and you get hung up in the wire. And that just makes you an easy target for the machine guns and their artillery and the flamethrowers on the other side. So we see all these devastating weapons being used because of, an, of a new technology. 
even more weapons. We see airplanes were invented in 1903, but by 1914 they've gone under such rapid development because of the war that now we have biplanes and triplanes, and these are primarily used to spy on the enemy. The planes aren't quite big enough yet to do massive bombing. That'll be World War II. Um, so we see these dogfights up in the air as the Allies with this blue target, uh, they send their planes across enemy lines to try to figure out if the Germans are massing for an attack or where their troops are. Then the Germans, and you can see the Iron Cross on the plane on the bottom, they will send planes up to try to stop them from their reconnaissance of the enemy. And so we see these dogfights that go on in the air. Now, um, we'll talk about trench warfare in a minute. Um, but towards the end of the war, to overcome trench warfare, we also see this new invention on the battlefield called tanks. And you can see it in the top right-hand corner. Tanks are these armored vehicles that are, can withstand machine gun fire, um, and troops can hide behind them, and that's one way to break up this whole um, trench warfare thing that we'll talk about. But they really become a factor at the end of the war. Um, on the seas, we see another new piece of technology. It's the undersea boat, or the undersea boot, as the Germans called it, or the submarine. Um, and so this is a new and definitely devastating way to harass enemy shipping um, and supply ships that are crossing the Atlantic. And so let's talk about trench warfare. Now early on, because of the machine guns and the new artillery pieces and the flamethrowers, the troops, if not the generals, the troops realize that while you're standing around waiting to, for the next attack, you just, just want to be standing there because you'll get cut down by machine gun fire or artillery fire. And so to survive, the troops will dig in. They'll dig a hole at first, and then they'll start to connect those holes. And before you know it, you have these long, hundreds of miles long trenches. And both sides engage in this trench warfare. So you have on one side the British and French in their trenches. And on the right-hand side, since this is the Western Front, you see the Germans in their trenches. And that's where the soldiers hang out um, and try to survive until a, a general will order an attack. Now, in between these trenches is what we call no man's land. Um, this used to be a thick forest, but all the trees have been cut down through explosions and, art and artillery fire and machine gun fire. And it's called no man's land. It's because it's the area in between the trenches. And whenever you go on an attack, you have to cross that no man's land to get to the other uh, trench line and attack the enemy. And everybody dies. They get cut down by artillery and flamethrowers, like I said, and, and machine guns. And so no man can live there. So it's just this kind of lunar landscape of craters, barbed wire, rotting bodies, death and destruction, landmines that we see between the trenches. Another problem with the trench with trench warfare, not only does it, you know the soldiers try to keep alive by hiding in the trenches, but this is Western Europe and it's, it's a very rainy climate. And so it rains all the time in the trenches without any trees or grass anymore it's all been blown away to hold the soil the soil becomes muddy and the trenches fill up with water and the soldiers have to deal with what's called trench foot they're standing in this water for days and days at a time and so their foot literally just starts to rot away um, so another gruesome aspect of life on the on the western front so I had told you that we see about a thousand casualties per day. Um, and so let's talk about one of the battles, just one of the battles, the Battle of the Somme. We see about a million casualties just in one battle. And it was the Battle of the Somme is the British are trying to make an advance. So they put this all-out attack, the British and the French, to try to push the German line back. And more than a million men will attack the German lines, um, and they will get they will be successful, but only enough to push the German lines back about five miles. And so we see them lose about a million men just to gain five miles. And so we see that during World War I on the Western Front, the front really doesn't change all that much throughout the war. It may vary a mile or two in whatever direction, east or west, but for the most part, we can't block, we can't break up this trench warfare. It's just too costly um, to humanity and to, to, to money and to weapons to try to push the enemy back, so we kind of stagnate. Um, throughout on the Western Front. It doesn't, the front doesn't move very much. So let's now switch gears and talk about the Eastern Front. Again, this isn't from the perspective of Germany. And so the Eastern Front is the battle lines between Germany and the Russian Empire. And this is a really long front. Uh, if you can see on this map, it, it stretches all the way from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south. And so 
if you remember the Schlieffen plan, it was that the Germans needed to knock the French out quickly in the Western Front, and then they could send all their forces to the Eastern Front. And as we said, that battle plan didn't work. Um, the Germans were stopped just outside of Paris. And so most of the German army is actually going to be on the Eastern Front during this war, fighting the Russians. Now, the Russians don't have a lot of industry. They haven't successfully industrialized as much as Germany or England or France has. Um, but they have a lot of people, and they have a lot of land. And that's going to work to the Russians' advantage. Um, and so we see the Eastern Front, we don't see as much trench warfare because there's just so much land to cover that even if you dig a trench, then somebody can just go around that trench. Um, and so we see a lot more movement on the Eastern Front going back and forth. And the Germans have a lot of early success. They're much more industrialized than the Russians, like I said. And they're able to push way into Russia because the Russians had a tougher time getting geared up for the war. And then eventually we have this battle called the Battle of Tannenberg. The Battle of Tannenberg, you only need to know it, is that the Russians, um, they, they, this is a battle on the Eastern Front where we see the Russians and the Germans fighting against each other. Um, and it basically will see that the Germans will push the Russians back after the Battle of Tannenberg for the rest of the war. Um, the Russians had a little bit of success because most of the German army was on the Western Front. But as soon as the Germans pull their troops off to the Eastern Front, we're going to see them be able to push, push, push the Russians. Now, even though the Russians have more men, um, they don't have as many bullets as the Germans do or many as machine guns. And so the Eastern Front, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the Russian Revolution on our next set of notes, it's going to take a huge toll on the Russian population. Um, they Basically, the Russians just resort to just throwing human waves at the Germans to try to stop the, the much more better equipped uh, German army. So next, Russia and the United States. So let's talk about how Russia eventually leaves World War I and the United States joins. So the Russian government, like I said, they are taking tremendous losses on the Eastern Front. The war is going very poorly. And so the Tsar, you can see a picture in his fancy uniform here, he decides that the, the Russian generals just are mishandling the war. That's the reason they're lo losing. And so he goes to the front to the himself to try to conduct the war. Even though he doesn't have a lot of military experience, he thinks, well, I'm the Tsar. I can do this. So he leaves behind back in Moscow. He leaves behind the Tsarina. Um, and she and the, the top nobles are in charge of, Rus of ruling Russia in his absence. Well, there's this guy named Rasputin, which we'll talk about in our next set of notes. He kind of mucks things up. But the war goes even worse for the Russians um, as the Tsar comes to the front. Things are not going well. And so the Russian Tsar is overthrown. The people of Russia have had enough. This war is not going well. The people of Russia think this war is only to make the Tsar richer, um, that he's going to benefit if they win and the people will just die. And so the Russian people overthrow the Tsar and they replace the Tsar in 1917 with what's called the Provisional Government. The Provisional Government is on the bottom right-hand picture here, and they are a democratic government. They are, we, we know Russia is no longer a monarchy, so we have a change over time here, and they're going to have democracy. And we have, the Russian people have high hopes for this new government. Finally, the Russian government's going to listen to us because we're going to elect people, um, and they're going to make, uh, they're going to make decisions for us. However, the problem is, is that the, the provisional government makes the faithful decision to stay in the war. They think about surrendering to the Germans, but that would cost them too much territory. It would make the new government look weak. And so they decide that they will continue fighting the war against the Germans. And this is a very unpopular decision with the Russian people because their husbands, brothers, fathers, whatever, are dying on the Eastern Front. And so it makes them very unpopular. And so the Communist Party that has been growing in Russia, they take advantage of this and they tell the people of Russia that if you overthrow the provisional government and put the Bolsheviks in charge, the Russian communists, the Bolsheviks, we will end this war today. Um, and so the people believe them. And so the Russian, we have the communist Russian revolution and the Russian Bolsheviks take over the government, overthrow the provisional government also in 1917, um, and they will immediately pull Russia out of the war. And so see, this will, this will then now free, this is good for Germany because now Germany is no longer fighting the Eastern Front. They are able to take their army and move them to the Western Front, hopefully with all of their army combined on the Western Front, they'll be able to win the war. We'll talk more about what's going on in Russia in our next set of notes. 
Next, U.S. entry into the war. If you've noticed, we haven't really talked about the United States in the war yet. America, at this point, thought the war is not our problem. This is a European deal. It has nothing to do with us. But in 1917, the United States did join the war. They declared war on Germany. Now, why did this happen? Well, it was because the United States was trying to make money. The United States uh, was trying to sell weapons and ammunition and artillery pieces to both sides of the war, both the German side of the war and the English and French side of the war, the Central Powers and the Triple Entente. Um, and as they were doing this, of course, this is helping the American economy. We're getting very rich by selling all this food and ammunition to both sides. But the British, they're smart. They realize that they don't want the Americans to sell any ammunition or food to the Germans. Um, that'll just help the Germans. And so the British tell the United States that we are going to blockade the German coastline. And you can see it on this map. And so the British blockade with their superior navy, they blockade the German coastline. And so now American ships cannot get into Germany to sell them weapons and food and supplies like that. Um, and at this point, the Americans could have decided, well, if we can't sell to one side, maybe we shouldn't sell to either side. But we certainly want to make some money in the war, and uh, we have our rights of a neutral power to trade with who we want to. Um, and so the United States will continue to sell weapons and food to England and France, but not to the Germans, because we can't get through the British blockade. Of course, this makes Germany upset. Germany says to the United States, look, we want to trade with you. We understand we can't now because of this British blockade. So if you can't trade with us, America, you also shouldn't trade with our enemies. Um, because if you think about it from the German perspective, if the United States is selling food and weapons and supplies to British and the French and not to the Germans, the United States has kind of taken a side in this war economically, if not militarily and politically. And so the Germans say, look, if you're not helping us, don't help our enemies. And the United States ignore that. They say we are a neutral country. We can trade with whoever we want. And so the Germans use their submarines and their submarines, their undersea boots or U-boats can get underneath the British blockade and sneak out, and they create what you see as a no-sail zone around the British Empire, or the British, I'm sorry, Great Britain, the British Islands. Um, and you can see it in kind of this darker color of blue on the map. And the, Brit uh, the Germans tell the Americans and the British, they say, look, any boat's caught, it doesn't matter what kind of boat it is, whether it's a cruise liner, a military boat, whatever, any boat's caught in this no-sail zone around Great Britain, we are going to sink, because we're going to assume that it's full of military supplies and food. Um, now, they tell the Americans up front about this, but the United States says, no, we want to make money, and we have the right to sell to whoever we want to, and so the United States ignores this no-sail zone. So one of the boats that is sailing through this no-sail zone is something called the Lusitania. The Lusitania is a British cruise ship, like carnival cruises or Norwegian crew lines, that kind of thing, where people take a vacation on it. But in the hold of the ship, th this ship goes from, from London to New York and back and forth again. And at, when the ship was in uh, New York, the United States war manufacturers had secretly sold a bunch of war materials to the British government, and they had put them in the hold of the ship, this cruise ship. Now, the Germans have spies in America, and they know this is happening. And so the Germans tell the United States, in the New York Times, they take out an ad, they say to Americans, don't get on board the Lusitania, we know it's carrying war supplies, we're going to it and we don't want to kill you. The Germans do not want to attack Americans because that'll draw the Americans into the war and they don't need another country to fight against. But Americans get on the ship anyway um, and the Lusitania gets within sight of the British coast, um, the coast of Ireland actually, and the German U-boats sink it, killing over 100 Americans. And of course this makes America very angry. Germany you don't have the right to kill Americans and the Germans say, well we warned you and we also don't want you selling to our allies. So the Americans are angry about this. There's a whole bunch of other ships that we don't need to go into as well, ships that Americans are on that are sunk by German U-boats. So with every new ship that the Germans sink, Americans getting angrier and angrier and more ready for war. Then the next thing is that the Americans find out about this thing called the Zimmerman Note. The German foreign secretary, he's kind of like our secretary of state, is a guy by the name of Arthur Zimmerman. And he sees that the United States is probably going to get dragged into this war. Um, and so he sends what he thinks is a secret telegram to the government of Mexico. 
and you can see it in this picture here, and he says to the government of Mexico, look, if the United States eventually does get involved in this war, what we want you to do, Mexico, is to declare war against the United States, basically distract America so they don't send any troops over to Europe. And when this war is over, we'll put pressure, and we win, Germany says, we'll put pressure on the Americans that they've got to give you a lot of the land back that they took during the Mexican-American War. Um, and so this is what Germany is hoping will happen. Now, the Mexicans are not dumb. They're, they're not going to declare war against the United States. But it was just a German idea, a German proposal. Well, the British intercept this telegram, and they're able to translate it and decode it. And so the British hold on to this note, the Zimmerman note, for just the right moment when Americans are really angry that more and more of their ships are being sunk. And when another ship is sunk, the British say, oh, look what we found. And they show the United States the Zimmerman note. And this is basically the last straw. When Americans see that their citizens are being killed on the open oceans because of German U-boat attacks, and Germany was trying to get Mexico to attack us, well, Americans are upset. They're angry. This is a matter of national honor and our rights as an independent nation. And so the United States is going to um, eventually declare war, well, quickly declare war against, against Germany. Another part, of, another factor into the United States' decision to declare war is that the President of the United States is a guy by the name of Woodrow Wilson, and he comes up with this thing called his 14 points. Woodrow Wilson is a crusading kind of guy who tries to make the world a better place. He's a reforming president, and he thinks that World War I will allow the United States to have an opportunity that if we enter this war, we will win, and we will make sure that we spread democracy around the world. That was one of his 14 points, that when the United States wins, we're going to spread democracy, and that could be that would be good. He also says that we will also end empire. He says that, you know, one of the things that caused people to go to war was this quest for empire. And basically, the biggest thing about Wilson's 14 points is that he wants to make World War I the final war, the war to end all wars. And so the 14 points are all geared toward in the future, when the war is over, we're going to get rid of anything that may cause another war. And so his 14 points say that there'll be freedom of the seas, there'll be no more U-boat attacks, there'll be no more empires, no more militarism, no more building up um, big armies, um, that will have what's called a League of Nations, where countries in the future, when World War I is over, they can go and peacefully gather together and figure out what their problems are and solve them by discussion rather than by attack. And so the United States, under Woodrow Wilson's uh, leadership, is going to try to make this war into something noble, something grand that will benefit all of humanity and end future wars. Now, we had talked about Wilson's idea of ending empire. Well, he talks about that in terms, he uses the words ethnic self-determination. In other words, what we're going to do is we're going to break up all the empires of the world, because that just causes us to declare war, and we'll let ethnic people around the world control themselves. And so here you're Vietnamese, you're not going to be controlled by the French, but you'll be controlled by the Vietnamese. And if you're African, you won't be controlled by Belgians anymore, you'll be controlled by other Africans. And so this gives great hope all around the world of people in colonies in these empires that World War I is going to mean something. Woodrow Wilson has says that this war is about ending empire. And so if you remember I talked about on a previous slide that lots of colonies around the world will fight in World War I. One, because the controlling country, their mother country, makes them but two, some of them willingly fight um, because they think this war, they believe Wilson, that this war will end empire, spread democracy, and give people ethnic self-determination, that they'll be able to control their own lives and there'll be no more empire in the world. So we'll come back to that and we'll talk later about if Woodrow Wilson gets his way. The next thing that AP wants to know about is this concept of total war. This war is so big and so expensive, and it's going to take so many people to win it, that the governments of the Western countries will grow in power. They will grow in power because they have to coordinate their efforts as a country to be able to pay for and to build for this war. And so what we see here as an example of this is in the past, before World War I, factories were making consumer goods, dresses, cars, those kinds of things. But now that the war is on, we need to produce tanks and shells and bullets and bombs and those kinds of things. And so the governments of the West, whether it's the United States or it's England or France or Germany, their governments will get stronger and more powerful and take more control over the economy, basically ending laissez-faire that we talked about in our previous 
period, period five. Um, now the government is going to be in control of the economy um, because they need to tell businesses to produce tanks instead of cars. And so we see that this is one way that the, the war is going to change the way governments interact with their economies. The governments will control, to kind of continue with this theme, what products are produced, how much things are going to cost, the quality and the quantity of goods, and East and, and European countries will also engage in rationing, which basically is telling consumers what they can buy and what they can't buy. Um, so if you're a British citizen and you want to go buy flour so you can make bread, well, no, no, the army needs flour. Um, or if you're a British citizen and you want to buy some gasoline for your car, no, the army needs gasoline for their tanks and planes. And so we see that the government not only controls what is being produced, but it's also controlling what is being consumed. So again, the overall idea here is that governments are getting more and more powerful and laissez-faire way of looking at the economy is starting to come to an end. Next, the state must limit freedom to support the war effort. So here's yet another example of how World War I is going to cause governments to get even more powerful than they were before the war. Um, if you remember, when we talked about in period five, we talked about the Enlightenment, we talked about freedom, democracy, equality, liberty, freedom of speech, those kinds of things. Well, in period six, at the very start of period six here, we're going to see that some of those freedoms are going to go away because the government needs to control how people think and they need to get the people to support the war. We need people working in factories. You need people joining the army. And so when the war starts, people are very excited about the war and they think, yes, this is a chance for England or Germany to show what we're made of, nationalism. But as the war goes on and the casualties mount, people realize that, wow, I could actually die in this war. And so people stop volunteering to join the military. And so the, the government has to move to a draft. They have to force people into the army. So this is an example of the loss of Enlightenment freedoms. Maybe it's necessary, but it's also something where the government comes in, takes you out of your life and says, here's a gun, go kill people or get killed. Um, and so we see that this is certainly an infringement on people's Enlightenment civil liberties, but like I said, the government feels it's necessary so that the so that the country will win the war. Next, we also see the government in control of labor. So once again, let's think about change over time. In period five, we saw that as industrialization started, unions had a real tough time forming. The governments and large corporations hated unions because they gave workers more pay and safer working conditions, and that cost money. But then as we went through the time period, by the end of period five, more and more people were in the factories. And so democratic governments had to give labor reforms. They had to shorten the work day, have safer working conditions, make unions legal, those kinds of things. Well, that's how we ended period five. When we start period six now, we see that the government is once again going to clamp down on unions. They're going to tell unions, look, you cannot go on strike because we need workers working. We need workers making tanks and planes and artillery pieces and bullets. And if you guys go on strike, that's not going to happen. And so we see the government um, kind of reverse itself and they take the side of business again and they start clamping down on unions and most famously in America the government says look if you're going to go on strike if you're not going to work then we're going to draft you immediately so it's the worker fight kind of rules and so once again we see that workers are losing some of the reforms and freedoms that they had prior to World War One. Next the importance of propaganda. Now propaganda is not something terribly new but we see that it's certainly going to be used more than ever before in World War I because we have technology that will allow us to get our message out. Governments need to convince people to support the war. So what's here in the bottom right-hand side is the British government saying, you know, you need to sign up for the war. Who is absent? Is it you? This is a propaganda poster trying to use peer pressure and guilt to get people to support the war. Or on the left-hand side, we see an American propaganda poster. It says, beat back the Hun, that was their name for Germans, with liberty bonds. And so this, you know, it's the government saying, look, Americans, support the war. A, a bond is when you loan the government money. And so, of course, wars are expensive. And so this is the United States government saying, look, Americans, lend the government money or else this German is going to sneak over the Atlantic Ocean and kill you with his bloody bayonet. So we see that the government uses, actively uses propaganda, a direct attempt to try to convince people to believe a certain way or believe a certain thing. And they're successful at it because we have mass ways of producing propaganda posters. Um, we'll see that we have better ways of communicating. Um, and so the governments are much more effective 
in getting people to believe what they want them to believe. And so I put it on this slide because this, if this is an example, propaganda is an example of how the government can somewhat control your freedoms. It can control what you think and how you think by using some of these emotional appeals to your patriotism um, or to fear that if you don't support the war, you're going to be killed by a German soldier. And so the end of the war and after. So let's wrap up World War I. So number one, it says the Ottoman Empire loses ground. The British troops, along with their colonials from Australia and New Zealand and India and Egypt, etc., they will not only fight the Ottoman Empire um, on the Anatolian Peninsula, but they'll also invade in Mesopotamia, or what is now Iraq, and also in Palestine, or what is now Israel. They're going to be invading from many different places using these colonials, and so AP wants you to know that here we see in the picture um, British troops that are Indian. They are from they're Indian from South um, Asia, and they are joining the British army to try to help the British fight the war because the British don't have enough troops to fight on all of these fronts. We also see in the bottom picture um, Australians there in Egypt. Um, and so all over the world, we're seeing the colonies being used to supplement and support these European wars. The Ottoman Empire so is being attacked from without. We already know it was weakening. And a lot of these ethnic groups that are in the Ottoman Empire, they're inspired by Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. They believe if the Allies, England, France, the United States, Russia, if they win the war, then Wilson's 14 points will go into effect and the Ottoman Empire will be broken up and the Egyptians will finally get to control Egypt for themselves, and Jordanians will be able to control Jordan by themselves, and so forth and so on. And so we see a bunch of ethnic groups rebel under Ottoman rule, and they, they try to weaken the Ottoman Empire from within, being inspired by Wilson's idea of ethnic self-determination. So the Ottoman Empire is now collapsed, and that leaves the major player, like we said, is Germany. Now, Germany is fighting this two-front war, um, uh, until we talked about how the communists took over Russia and withdrew Russian, um, you know, and, and withdrew Russian fighting in the war. And so we can see in this picture that Germany, once the Russians are out of the war, Germany takes what's left of its army on the Eastern Front and moves them back to the Western Front. And like I told you, is this Germany is going to have this all-out united German push to try to knock the French and the UK out of the war. But just in the nick of time, the United States arrive. If you remember, we had talked about in our previous slide why the United States arrived. And by 1918, the very end of the war, the United States was able to get enough troops to cross the Atlantic to augment the remaining British and French army. And that is just enough troops to stop this all-out German advance. And when the Germans try this advance and run into the American reinforcements, that's it. The Germans are literally out of men, out of materials, out of money, and they realize that they have to surrender. The war is over. They've exhausted themselves. Now, the Germans try to surrender, but according to Wilson's 14 points, this war is about spreading democracy. And so Wilson insists, before the Germans can surrender, the Germans have to get rid of their king, their Kaiser. He says, we're fighting this war as Americans because we want to spread democracy, and that includes the Germany too. And so the, try to, the Germans try to surrender, um, but the United States says no until they get with their Kaiser, and finally the Germans do. We'll talk about the long-term impact of this um, in future lectures, but we'll see that the Germans no longer will have a monarchy. They're going to switch to a democratic government because of World War II. So on November 11th, um, 1918, on the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month, an armistice is called. In other words, that means that they stop fighting and World War I is over. You see these troops are very happy. They, they're 18-year-old troops probably and they're very happy they're going to get to see 19. Um, and so we see that the war finally comes to an end. So the Paris Peace Conference. So we know the war is over. We're not fighting anymore. And so the, the countries in the war come together in Paris. Um, right outside of Paris is the old palace that Louis XIV had built, the, the Palace of Versailles. Um, and so these England, France, the United States, Russia, etc., they come to this, to this treaty room in Versailles and they decide what are we going to do 
at the end of this war, and it's very punitive. England and France are devastated by this war, and so uh, and, and now the Russians, I'm sorry, I misspoke, the Russians don't come because they're already out of the war, but the English and the French are devastated by this war, and they want payback. They are angry at the Germans for causing so many English and French young men to die, and this war to be so expensive, and so they want to punish Germany for this war. And so one of the things they do at the Treaty of Versailles is they make the Germans sign the War Guilt Clause. It basically, Germany has to say that they're at the fault for the war. Um, which is not true. If you remember, Germany did not start the war. It was started with an assassination in Serbia. Um, but it doesn't matter. We're angry. And so the Germans have to take the blame for the war. And if this is going to make the German people very angry, because nobody likes to take the blame for something you didn't do. Um, and so we'll see that that will create anger and hostility, and that'll be a problem further on when we talk about Germany in the 1920s and 30s. So Germany has to take the blame for the war, but that also means that they have to pay for the war because whoever started the war has to pay for the war, and so that's called reparations. And so Germany is now going to be just flat, busted, broke after World War I. Not only are they broke because of the war, but they now also, you know, all the, the weapons they had to buy, but now they also have to pay back the English and the French for all of the cost of their weapons, too. I mean, it stands to reason if Germany is to blame, then England and France say, Germany, you also have to pay us back everything we spent on the war. And so this is going to cause economic tragedy, really, in Germany. And we're going to talk about, again, the problems that causes in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. So we have a Germany that's angry, and we have a Germany that's broke. Next, Germany and the Ottoman Empire are going to lose their colonies. This is where Woodrow Wilson's 14 points comes into play. Um, the United States and Woodrow Wilson at Versailles insist that this is about ending empire. Now, the English and French are not going to give up their empire. They say to Wilson, forget it. We need our empire to help us rebuild from the war. And that was your 14 points, not our 14 points. And so the English and French don't give up their empire. But they say, but we're okay with, you know, having the, the losers give up their empire. And so the Germans are going to have to give up their colonies, which makes the German people very angry. They go from this powerful world power to now just Germany. And also the Ottoman Empire is going to be split up. And so if we see in the bottom picture, most of the colonies, the, the countries that are pictured there, they were part of the um, Ottoman Empire, at least in part. And so now we're going to divide them up into different groups. And so the state of Iraq is born, and Syria, and Jordan, and Egypt, and it, the Ottoman Empire itself is going to be divided up into Turkey. Um, and so we see that new countries are going to be on the map of the world. Um, and this is in line with Woodrow Wilson's 14 points that they should have ethnic self determination. People in what used to be called Mesopotamia, are now going to be called Iraq, and Iraqis are going to control themselves. There's a problem here, is that, we'll use Iraq as a great example, that there is no such thing as an Iraqi. There was no ethnic group that was Iraqi. Um, Iraq had three major different ethnic groups in it. We don't need to go into it now, but the Europeans at Versailles didn't worry about those uh, ethnic groups. They just drew boundaries where they wanted to draw the boundaries, and so they create new countries, but in the future, they'll be very destabilized countries because they're composed of ethnic groups that don't really get along, that don't want to share the same country, and we'll talk about that much later when we get to the end of period six. So these new countries are created of the Ottoman Empire, um, and so the Ottoman Empire, that's a change over time, ceased to exist because of the Treaty of Versailles in World War I. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is also split up. Now, let me go back for just a second. This word mandates. Now, um, when the Ottoman Empire is split up, the people in Iran, the Persians, they're very excited about the people in Iraq, are excited about the people in Syria, excited about it. They think, finally, we're going to get to control ourselves. No more empire, no more Ottomans, no more anybody else. But the English and French insist that these Syrians or Jordanians or Egyptians, they're not civilized enough to be able to run their own affairs. And so we, they say to America, look, there has to be some kind of a, a period where we teach these people how to have democracy because they've never had it before. Um, and we kind of shepherd them into the modern world and the democratic world. Um, and so we see that England and France are going to take over some of these areas as mandates. Mandate says it's basically a temporary colony, and we're going to be in charge of this area um, until they have demonstrated that they're mature enough to be able to hand democracy and independence on their own. 
Call it what you will, it's really just an expansion of French and English imperialism. England and France see this as their opportunity to cash in after World War I, and they need to rebuild their country, which means they need raw materials and oil and everything else, and they can get some of these things in these former Ottoman territories. And so Wilson's 14 points really basically fails. Um, we don't get ethnic self-determination around the world. We certainly don't get it here in Southwest Asia. Um, and so we see that there's a lot of anger and resentment towards the United States because people in this area felt that America promised them something that didn't get fulfilled. There's also going to be a lot of anger in America, Woodrow Wilson, because he promised Americans that World War I would end empire, and it certainly didn't do that. Next, the Austro-Hungarian Empire will also get split up. So if you look at the top map, that's where the Austro-Hungarian Empire was. And now if we look at the bottom map, this is what it looks like after the war. And we can see that the new states of Czechoslovakia, Austria, Hungary are split up. Um, we have Yugoslavia that's created. Romania gets bigger. Um, and so we see that we're trying to create ethnic self-determination in Europe. So Europeans immediately get independence um, because they're, they're white and they're European and we believe that they can handle democracy. And so they get ethnic self-determination, but not, of course, the people who are living in the Ottoman Empire. So we see certainly different a standard being applied to people depending on where you live. Um, th there's going to be other problems with this as well. We'll talk about in the future. Yugoslavia isn't, there's no such thing as a Yugoslavian person. They have a bunch of different ethnic groups, but there's so many of them that the, the, you know, the French and the Americans and the British at Versailles said, well, we can't solve that now. Let's just make it one big country. So that'll cause problems in, in the future. But we see that we are remaking the map of Southwest Asia and of Eastern Europe as a result of this war. Some empires like the Austro-Hungarians and the Ottomans just cease to exist. Also, we're going to have German disarmament. Now, Woodrow Wilson wanted everybody to disarm. He wanted an end to militarism because he figured that was one thing that could lead to war is that if the countries have all these weapons. But England and France, no way are they going to you know, demilitarize. They don't trust the Germans. So they're going to keep their military, but they don't want the Germans to get, uh, you know, uh, rise again to power. And so England and France at the Treaty of Versailles demand that Germany disarms, which is humiliating for the Germans. They go from this world power with colonies and a large empire to taking the blame for the war, being broke by the war, and not even having a military anymore. So like I said, the Treaty of Versailles is going to create a lot of anger and hostility in Germany towards England and France in the future. And we will talk about uh, Adolf Hitler, who's able to tap into some of that anger when we get into the 1930s. Finally, uh, the 14th point of Wilson's 14 points, a League of Nations. There will be a League of Nations established. If you remember, I had said that the League of Nations is this attempt to try to end future wars where it's a safe place where a nation can go to talk out their differences rather than resort to force of arms. And so the League of Nations will be created, but, the, but there will be some key countries that don't join. Germany doesn't join and because we don't trust Germany and we don't want them to be as part of it. And Germany is a major country. And if you want the League of Nations to be powerful and successful, you have to have major nations in the League of Nations. Russia doesn't join because they're communists and we don't want communists in, you know, sharing power with us in the League of Nations. And even the United States themselves don't join. The U.S. came up with the League of Nations, but they don't join because the United States, they're very angry at the Treaty of Versailles. Woodrow Wilson promised Americans that this would be a war to end all wars, and we would get rid of everything that led to World War I. But the Treaty of Versailles did not do any of that. It didn't get rid of militarism. It didn't get rid of empire. Um, it just made England and France more powerful and not America. And, it, you know, it created animosity in Germany. And so many Americans say that, you know what, to heck with the world. And America becomes isolationist, which means America wants to just turn its back on the world and say, you know what, we made a mistake getting involved in World War I. It didn't help us at all. It didn't end future wars. It didn't solve the problems that we would think it was going to solve. And so the United States is very disillusioned with the war. And so they say, we're not going to join the League of Nations because we don't care about the rest of the world. And the League of Nations is not going to be successful, and it's not going to last very long. You have to have all the major world players in the League of Nations if you want it to be successful, and many countries just aren't in it. And so it will eventually fizzle and go away. So the 14 points, not very successful. So how does the war affect women? Well, women are going to go through a major transformation because of World War I. Before World War I, yes, a lot of women were involved in factory work. 
Um, but still, a majority of women uh, were in the cult of domesticity, or they were still on the farm helping out. But World War I, with its emphasis on factories and all-out production, is going to cause more urbanization. It's going to cause more factories. And when the men went away to fight in the war, somebody had to make those bombs and bullets, and it was women. And so we see overall the number of women that are involved in factories goes up. And so the cult of domesticity takes a little bit of a hit here, and we see women leaving the home and going to work in factories or um, helping the army as to run as nurses or running businesses when the men are away or family farms. Because of this, Women have more now economic freedom. They now have their own jobs and they demand political freedom as well. And so there's this large movement um, for to get women's suffrage. Women have long been campaigning for this, but World War I gives them that last push. Nations are grateful for the women helping out in the war and they want to reward them for that. Plus, women have a lot of economic power now because they've got uh, jobs. And so we see that grateful nations and insistent women demand that they give women the right to vote. And so finally, here in the very last time period of the course in period six, women, at least in Western Europe and the United States, are going to get the right to vote as a result of World War I. So a definite change. Next, we're going to see... Period 6 it talks about the spread of diseases around the world. And we'll talk about AIDS and swine flu and those kinds of things later. Um, but one of the first diseases that we see that will spread all around the world as a pandemic, pandemic means around the world, is the Spanish flu um, or the H1N1 virus. Now the Spanish flu probably originally came from China, but it's going to make its way eventually to Europe. And while it's in Europe, all of those soldiers that are in Europe, whether they're from the United States, they're from India, um, they're from Egypt, wherever, all of those soldiers are going to be concentrated in Europe, and they're going to get exposed to this Spanish flu. Um, and when they go home, back to America, or back to Egypt, or India, or to wherever they're from, or Australia, they're going to bring this virus with them. And so this, this flu um, is going to spread all around the world. So from 1918 to 1920, we see the Spanish flu, or what's known as the influenza epidemic, the pandemic, and somewhere between 50 and 100 million people will die because of this of this very viral and uh, strain of the flu. 3% of the world's population, or um, about 27% of the population, will get infected. Um, so this is a quarter of the world's population um, is going to get, get the flu, and then about a third of the world's population is going to die from this within just a few years. This is much more than who died in World War I. Um, and so we see um, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of Period 6 is that we're going to see the spread of worldwide diseases. As the world gets more interconnected because of war in this case, we're going to see diseases spread around the world. And that ends our PowerPoint for World War I.